Hey guys, this is a brief video overseeing the most important aspects of tubular interstitial nephritis. First of all, what's TIN? It's a renal lesion that typically causes a decline in renal function and has an inflammatory infiltrate in the kidney interstitium. So now that we know what TIN is, we have to understand the mechanisms behind its pathophysiology. You are always going to have an insult. Some are more obvious than others. Some examples for both acute and chronic TIN are drugs, heavy metals, obstruction, and immune disease. In acute TIN, there's preservation of the basement membrane and eventual resolution with removal of the insult, whereas in chronic TIN, there's activation of TGF-beta and NF-kappa-B that leads to scarring, fibrosis, tubular atrophy, and finally, chronic kidney disease. Now, regarding etiology, acute TIN is mostly, mostly caused by the following. Hypersensitivity to reactions, most commonly associated with penicillins and NSAIDs, immunologic disease, transplant rejection, and various infections, either bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic. Chronic TIN, on the other hand, is associated with drugs as well, and sets an immunosuppressants, heavy metals like lead, obstruction from prostate cancer or calculi, immune disease, atherosclerosis, genetics, and other various causes. Identifying the cause of the tubular injury is important in the diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis of this pathology. There are a few populations where TIN is more common. Analgesic nephropathy is up to five to six times more common in women. This is in part because women consume more pain medications overall. Lead nephropathy is considered to be more common in African Americans due to various socioeconomical factors associated with household and work exposure to lead. Atherosclerotic and or ischemic kidney disease is evidently more common in the elderly. Just remember that atherosclerosis is way more common as age progresses. So, we have to have a suspicion of TIN when we have this triad, rash, fever, and eosinophilia or eosinophiluria. Finding the complete triad is actually rare, it only happens in about 10% of cases, but any of these three can point you towards investigating renal function. Most of the time, TIN manifests itself as, as acute kidney injury. It can also present itself as gross hematuria and, more, and in more severe cases with Fanconi syndrome. It is very important to know that these reactions are mediated by hypersensitivity and not by direct toxicity by the insulting agent. Common causes of acute TIN are antibiotics, NSAIDs, diuretics, allopurinol, phenytoin, rifampin, interferon alpha, and PPIs. TIN has almost the same manifestations regardless of the culprit, so it's important to differentiate those that have unique characteristics. For example, NSAIDs are usually found in the elderly because this population has a higher incidence of arthritic disorders and pain-related disorders. TIN provoked by NSAIDs can present as nephrotic syndrome, and in the biopsy you can observe minimal change in nephrosis with interstitial nephritis. Antibiotic-induced TIN, on the other hand, is usually seen in the hospital setting with rash, pyuria, hematuria, moderate proteinuria, and eosinophilia. It can also present with granulomas. Something unique about the anti-tuberculosis medication refam is that this TIN can present with Ig lichen casts in your analysis. Now, chronic TIN is a different story. Its presentation is much more insidious and has a wide variety of causes. TIN caused by analgesics is usually due to long-term combinations of medications and usually presents in women in the 6th or 7th decade with episodes of papillary necrosis or renal insufficiency, modest proteinuria, pyuria, and anemia. Lead nephropathy, when acute, presents with encephalopathy and acute kidney injury with Fanconi syndrome. Chronic lead nephropathy almost always presents with hypertension and disproportionately worse hyperuricemia when compared to other kidney diseases. Atherosclerotic kidney disease commonly presents in elderly white males who smoke. It's commonly associated with dyslipidemias, coronary, carotid, and peripheral artery disease. It usually presents with hypertension, azotemia, proteinuria, and the nephritic range. Cholesterol microembolic disease is due to destabilization of atheroma plaques with the subsequent cholesterol crystals lodging in kidney vessels. These crystals also run havoc in the CNS, retinal arteries in the form of Hollenhorst plaques, skin in the form of scabs, and the levator reticulares. It is usually accompanied by systemic signs such as fever, leukocytosis, eosinophilia, elevated ESR, and low complement. Lithium nephropathy causes distal tubular dysfunction via downregulation of acroporin 2, and this happens in up to 50% of patients receiving chronic lithium therapy. Psychosporin and tacrolimus are known to be potent vasoconstrictors that eventually cause hypertension, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. Nephropathy is common among kidney, heart, liver, and pancreas transplants. Obstructing nephropathy is related to prostatic disease. In older males, kidney stones, neoplasms, and it presents with modest proteinuria and hyperkalemic RTA. Balkan endemic nephropathy is commonly found in people that have lived for at least 15 to 20 years in the Balkans. They are usually not hypertensive but have profound anemia. Most of these patients end in end-stage renal disease and up to 40% develop urethral tumors. 
For diagnosis, it is super important that you have a thorough history. This will guide you towards next step in, in diagnosis and treatment. Your analysis can show proteinuria, some things in the nephrotic range when associated with NSAIDs, hematuria, pyuria with or without bacteria. Microscopic examination will most likely show casts, white blood cells, eosinophils, and crystals. If you have suspicion of lead nephropathy, you can order a 24-hour EDTA, which will show more than 0.6 grams in 24 hours if it's positive for lead toxicity. The CBC will show eosinophilia half of the time. It can also show low bicarbonate, which would be associated with metabolic acidosis, hypo or hyperkalemia, usually dependent on the inciting agent. Kidney biopsy is a definitive test for diagnosing a QTIN. It is not always necessary because history can be enough in some cases. Imaging studies might be helpful in distinguishing between acute and chronic and determining the amount of damage taken by the kidney. Ultrasounds can detect hydronephrosis and calculi. Normal kidney size favors a QTIN, whereas shrunken kidneys will point towards chronic. On CT scan, you can observe microcalcifications in papillary tips, usually associated with NSAID. If you do need a tour a kidney biopsy, you will most certainly find mononuclear infiltrates, often with eosinophils in the parenchyma. It will always spread the glomeruli. You can also see fibrosis, necrosis, and or atrophy in severe or chronic cases. So, how do you treat these patients? In a QTIN, the easiest and most logical thing to do is remove the offending agent. This will usually end in resolution of the clinical picture, but in some cases, you will also need high doses of steroids in order to attenuate the inflammatory response and shorten the duration of the spell. In a chronic TIN, there's a bit more to do. In analgesic nephropathy, you should also discontinue the offending agent and give supported care, fluid, and, and dialysis if needed. In cyclosporin or tacolimus related toxicity, the dose should be lowered and target minimum therapeutic levels. You can also aim to discontinue and or switch the immunosuppressive therapy. In lead nephropathy, you should aim for extended chelation with treatment with EDTA or succimer, which has only been shown to work in children. Avoid additional exposure and management of complications like hypertension, gout, and chronic kidney disease. For atherosclerotic and microembolic disease, it is important to have an adequate control of hypertension, cessation of smoking, and vigorous control of dyslipidemia. And that's about it for tubular incision nephritis. I hope this video helps you in your studies, and thanks.